Thank you, Jesus. Welcome to Impact Thursday night. I did pick the songs on purpose, but I cannot operate the light. There we go. And um, because we have a lot to celebrate, and the Lord reminded me he gave me a word yesterday. I wrote it down, so I'm just going to read it. It's a short one. It says, for indeed your case has been brought before me and the courts of heaven. They have ruled in favor of the prayers of the saints. For the ancient of days declares mercy, mercy, mercy over a nation who has not regarded my truth and not my ways for decades. But today, if you will receive my verdict and run with my blessing, I am leaving you. You will see days of great harvest. You will see years of plenty, a harvest of souls and plenty of victories that will cause my name to be great on the earth. I am releasing boldness to share the gospel of the kingdom. And if you will obey me, great and miraculous signs will follow. Father, I thank you, Jesus, that we will be faithful to the task at hand, Jesus. I pray, Father, we will not take for granted your mercies, your forgiveness, your blessings. But, Father, we will use it to make your name and your renown great here on the earth, Jesus. It is all about you. The nations of the earth are your inheritance, Jesus. Lord, I thank you. You would anoint us with boldness in this season in Jesus' name. Um, so welcome to Impact Thursday night. I am Joanna. I'm one of the ministers and Trish is going to be my partner in crime tonight. We're not in crime. We're actually in Jesus tonight. <laughs> no crime here except to the enemy's camp. So um, we're going to be a team tonight in the prophetic. And um, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go and do this part because this part is the part that I'm not great at, and that is the announcements. And the only reason I'm not great at is I get too excited, and I think y'all don't need to know where you're at. So um, for those on the video, we are at 2260 Holly Springs Parkway, and we're at the top of the hill in Holly Springs, and we welcome you to come out and visit us. We are meeting, and every night is just an awesome night. We never know what the Holy Spirit's going to do, but that's what's exciting about him. He's alive. He's living, and he is in us so um so you can come and join us so this is our thursday night this is our night where it's an activation night often the lord will allow us to activate each other the spirit of god in each other activates each other and then also we can call out giftings also the Lord is teaching us to how to flow as a body. You have freedom in this house that you might not have at your church, not because your church doesn't want to, but because they don't understand how to. We take those risks because we want to see God's kingdom moving in each and every one of us. We believe that. That's something we agree wholeheartedly on. So it's it's never, the, the only thing that I would say is when God gives you something, be bold. Be bold to give it. We're here together to test it. You're not going to say something that's going to throw God off. And God's always got a way to get us back. When we're just a little off, he'll just bring us back gently. It's a good thing. And you'll learn how to flow in your gift. Because the Bible says we can all prophesy. That is something we all can do. Because Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If you're a born-again believer. Um, so, and, um, so we're going to go this Friday would normally be our prayer night, but we are going to start in August. We are going to start August 5th and we are going to be praying every Friday till the midterm. We know it's a season of war and warfare, and we're going to, I believe God's going to give us the victory. We're stepping in that direction, but all of you know that God likes us to be part of that journey. So he doesn't just fall out of the sky. It comes when his people pray and declare his word, his truth, and his promises. So God answers prayer, and so we believe in that here in this house, and we're going to start pressing in every Friday come August 5th. And, um, and with that, I'm going to invite Jessica up because she has an announcement. Her and Carrie have an outreach that they're going to be part of. And I'd just like you to hear from her heart. Thank you. Hey, my name is Jessica Fogel. And um, Saturday, July 9th, we are going to be holding an all-day discipleship training and activation day. 
Is uh, anybody familiar with um, the last Reformation, Torben Sondergaard, TLR? Okay, one. <laughs> Anyways, it's going to be very similar to his uh, kickstarts, kickstarting us into using the gifts that we have been given, kickstarting us into getting comfortable, stepping out of our comfort zone, being bold, and preaching the gospel to every creature as we've been commanded. Um, I was at um, an apostolic church about two months ago, and uh, the preacher was telling everyone in, in the church, saying, now next, you know, next week, this, this Sunday, make sure you bring somebody with you. We got to get people saved. We got to get people saved. And the Lord said, their heart is in the right place, but they're doing it all wrong. We need to go out and meet people where they are. We can't try to bring people in and get them saved in the church. Jesus has taught us to go out. And that is what we need to be doing. And so that, that is what this day is going to be all about. We're going to learn how to pray for each other, for healing, for deliverance, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're also going to be doing water baptisms. And everybody is to be involved. Everybody's there to learn. It's not just going to be me and the others up front doing all of this, baptizing and praying for everyone. Each one of you and everyone who comes are also going to be praying for each other, baptizing each other, and filling each other with the Holy Spirit. We're also going to go out for outreach. Um, we'll break up into small groups and just have an amazing day with the Lord. And then we're going to come back and share testimonies of how good God is. So I hope you can join us. That sounds awesome. And it's going to be at Go Church, which is, we love Go Church. It's just a couple of exits north in Ballground. Ballground sounds far, but it's not. It's really just a tiny bit up the road north. And um, yes, and then address is up there. So um, you can let um, Gospel Outreach Church, 835 Milner Spr Mineral Springs Road. Yeah, in Ballground. It's just literally right off um, the exit up 575. So, um, yeah, so it's going to be amazing. This is what it's about. This is part of what we're going to need to be purposeful in doing in this season. You know, we need to do it as we go, and then we need to purposely get ourselves accustomed to this being normal. Because, quite frankly, this isn't normal in the church. It should be. And that's why our churches have begun to teach such a shallow version of the gospel because we're teaching it to new people, which we're supposed to be training and sharpening our swords when we're together at church. So we're not, so we're not, you know, yes, people get saved in the church. That's awesome. But that's not our goal. Our goal is to train and equip and encourage each other, get out there to win the loss. So anyway, all right. And so I wanted to, some of you are going tomorrow night, the flashpoint. I don't know who all's going, but this, I found a friend sent me a clip and it just got me excited. So I just wanted to show you a little clip. This happened today. From what I can tell, it's a group of pastors. Um, this is Gene and um, he's given us a little glimpse, but it's a group of pastors um, that they all met here in Atlanta metro area. And believe it or not, two of the people on there we knew from like 25 years ago. They were not pastors, they're just some friends of ours who are missionaries. I was like, oh, that's awesome. So, okay. Hey, oh my gosh, you guys don't know, if you didn't come to Atlanta, you've missed it. Look at all these pastors here. We've just been talking for about the last, oh, we've been here for three hours and they won't go home. You know, I don't know what to do. Flashpoint's not until tomorrow night. Uh, but speaking of tonight, you better be watching tonight. It's going to be amazing. Listen, you're going to see some stuff you haven't seen before. Got Greg Phillip on. Remember him from True the Vote? He's the tech guy that knew all about how this thing worked when they stole the vote right here in Atlanta. You want to be there, watch this. But listen, today we've spent some time with these pastors, loving on them, talking about the event coming up tomorrow night. Man, what a great time to see people coming together. If you weren't here, you need to let us know next time. We want to be, we want to see you here with us with all the pastors. But listen, this is great for such a time as this. We're coming in together. Come here, Riley. Riley's been out on the streets, and we've been winning people. How many, how many souls you got sold? 124 so 124 far. so far. And listen, this has all come up organically at the last minute. We really pushed heavily into getting these guys mobilized, put this together in less than two weeks. Hell yeah, this is God. This is revival. This is the great awakening, what's going on right here. 
Yeah. How often can you see 120 people say, that is God? It's so amazing. We started at a church on Tuesday, Pastor Bruce Rhodes, and uh, 20 of his congregation members came out with us. And it's so exciting. One lady got so excited, she called her cousin, and she was like, Riley told me to call you. You need to get saved. He got saved, said the prayer. It's so awesome. Well, that is good. Riley said to call you. you need, Riley says you need to get saved. So if you're not saved, you need to find out how to get saved. Yeah. Okay. Barry Tubbs here, working the room. All right, guys, we'll see you t tonight. Watch Flashpoint tonight. It'll be from the arena. Nobody will be there except us. But tomorrow night, you need to come early. Come early. Doors open at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Be here so you can see what's going to happen. A lot of stuff happening in the pre-show before we go live at 7 o'clock. The program is going to be, oh, listen, late-breaking news. We got, can I tell them? Yeah. Marjorie Taylor Greene's going to be in the house. Tomorrow night, uh, Abby Johnson in the house. Tomorrow night, Lance Hank Mario Dutch Sheets in the house. Listen, there's no better place to be than right here in Duluth, Georgia, at the Gas South Arena. Come on, we're, we're Come gonna be here. real GoVictory.com slash FP Live. Listen, it's free. All that we just want to know how many people we can plan for. We'll open up the curtains. We'll open up the doors. Uh, you know, this is what it's all about, us coming together and seeing a move of God happen. We're going to, I talked to Hank Kuhneman, he's bouncing around, ready to get down here. Lance and Mario, they're ready to get down here. We're going to see God do stuff here in Georgia like we've been waiting to see for a very long, long time. Who are Pastor Philip over here. Hey, Pastor Philip. Hey. We got 394 people on the Victory Channel Facebook page. What do you think right. about today? It is a downpour here in this room right now of all of these leaders and pastors who are excited to bring this man and Flashpoint to Georgia because we are going to release a move of God tomorrow night. You don't want to miss it. I love that. Holy Ghost downpour. How Holy Ghost Come downpour. On. Come on. We've been praying for rain and it is here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. So you better be here. I want to shake your hand. I want to see you tomorrow night. All right. See ya. God bless. So, um, yeah, yeah, a group of us are going, we're just meeting over there. Uh, we're going to try to get there. You need to get there at 5. There's still, it's free. You just need to register so they get a head count. Um, so you can do it if you want to go. Um, everyone, you know, however the Lord leads, I'm super excited because um, I've been following some of these people, and they've been feeding me in this season. And I'm grateful to just be a part. I listened to the last one. We kind of give you the testimony. But people who come in there that think they know the Lord, many find out they didn't know him, but they leave knowing him. And they leave spirit-filled. And they leave assured that America will be saved. And we need a move of God in this nation because we are the most corrupt state. The elections are atrocious. Our midterm... Um, it wasn't midterm, um, primary, just a farce. We're finding out all kinds of fraud that happened, but Jesus, he will not be mocked. So prayer can change this and God can come up with a way. And I believe this is part of that. I believe the Lord strategically brought them here so we could intercede together over the corruption, over the spirits that are blocking. And there, and, and whether some of you, most of you would know in this room, but there is a move to make us a liberal state. And we are not a liberal state. We are not. We are a Jesus state. And we believe in the truth. And there has been a just an onslaught to take this state away from um, those who believe in truth. And so I believe tomorrow night is a turning of the tide for that and I'm excited I'm encouraged and yeah I mean this is going to get this this next four months it's going to get tough in a good healthy way it's going to get messy but you know we can do this thing we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us but seriously where else are we going to go who else has the words of life so guys this is our watch
watch. This is our time. And we got to fight in the spirit like we've never fought before because God's weapons are mighty for pulling down strongholds. And that's what we're up against. This is a weapons. This is in the spirit. We've got to get radical and step out and get bold so that we can see Jesus be magnified in this nation. The Lord has given us a major win and he's downloading victories, but we got to do our part. It's our turn. It's our time. So I'm super excited and I love it that God's bringing the body together. That excites me more to seeing everybody together because yeah. And if those of you, if, if the Lord's not leading you go, that is totally fine. But I would ask you to pray for us to be protected because we're all going to be in one central location. And in Jesus name, we're going to be fine. But, but we appreciate and even covet your prayers for real. We don't take light this hour. We can't be foolish. And, um, so, but I believe, um, I, we pray a lot about it. Believe it or not, I'm not a fan of big meeting. I love them in my spirit, but I'm not a fan of a million people in a room. That's not my thing. My thing. I like small meetings, but I know the Lord said to go, and, and we're going to go. So I'm going to invite Trish up now because I'm going to let her introduce James. She's got a word and take us into this side of our mess. Well, it, kind of, it, it goes along with what Joanna was saying. and uh, I have a word and a couple of three consecutive incidents incidences that happened this week and one was just as re recent as today and um this gentleman passed by me and i just kind of noticed him i didn't get a word i didn't get a um a vision i didn't get anything i didn't hear anything feel anything and all of a sudden next thing i know i'm just kind of like hey buddy i'm grabbing him on and i had this compassion that literally swelled up inside me i mean i was Moved with compassion. Obviously, Jesus was moved with compassion. So then I just said, well, I'm just going to pray for you. I didn't ask him. Usually I ask people, but I didn't ask him. And so I started praying for him and declaring who he was in the Lord. And he, he was, he's a big dude, probably about 6'6", six, six, you know. And he was crying and he was bawling. And then he told me, he said, my wife had, is on dialysis for her liver. And my sister has already gone through it. It's been about three years, and she did get a transplant. He said, so God has prepared me on how to, to pray and move in this season. And he was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he said, and I just got custody of my daughter. And the, the, it just gave him such comfort. I didn't want to be inconvenienced because it was, it was like not on my radar to do that. I was literally in another place up here in my head. And it really goes along with what Joanna was saying. We have to persevere and push and we have to be ready all the time we have a momentum now because the iniquity has been lifted off this nation so let's go for it let's pray in the spirit at all times and so um i'm just going to read something in ephesians it says praying always as paul we all know paul wrote it praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints and for me that that utter that and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That gentleman all of a sudden knew the mystery of the gospel. And two others, one was a lady and one was a gentleman this week as well. And it was not something I was thinking about doing. I didn't get anything. It was just it was in an instant it was compassion and it was a compelling. I didn't think about being afraid. I didn't think about what anybody thought. I didn't think about who was looking and who wasn't looking. I didn't think about the results because those belong to the Holy Spirit. So as we pray in the Spirit and as we sit in the Word and we receive the Word and we let God visit our hearts and we go to Him and we let Him minister to us, there is nothing that we cannot do. We can move past any obstacle. When the enemy is playing in your head 24-7, and you can't, you, you're in fear, you're in discouragement, you're paralyzed. If all you can say is Jesus, if I, be, you know, if I be lifted up, he will draw all men unto me. He will draw you back to him. His name is powerful, and I know we all know that, but we are in for a season where the demons are screaming, and the Lion of Judah is roaring, and the dark is going to be very dark, and the glory of God is going to be mighty. And if we are the only ones standing, let it be us. 
but it's an individual choice. So that's what I'm sharing because the opportunities are going to come and you're not going to even know they're there. But your spirit will know and your spirit man will be ready. So stay ready. What can you do to become ready? What can you do to persevere even more into what God's called you to do? Because there's nothing that he has called us to do that's insignificant. And if you're thinking about it too much, then you think you have something to do with it. And you might retreat. So don't retreat. Because then it's like you're making it about you. But anyway, I'm just sharing that because I just love how God is surprising me. And how he is touching someone's heart. And how they are receiving his compassion. That's the only true love. And that's truth. And with that... James Trevet is going to come up and minister the word. He gave a great word last week. I don't know if it's, is it uh, related to that? Is it part two or it's a part two? So it was pretty dynamic. So let's welcome James. Well, Lord, we thank you. We're excited, Lord, for what you're doing. We're exciting, Lord, because we can see your hand. We can see your momentum. We can see the things that you're doing out there, Lord, and we want to be a part of it. And Lord, Tonight I ask you just to touch each one here, Lord, and just download whatever they need for the purposes and destinies that they have and for the things that they'll be even needing for this coming week, the truth, Lord, the revelation that you need to give, the anointing and the power. So, Lord, we want to walk in your ways. We do not want to miss a thing in this time. So we thank you, Lord. We bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we are going to be talking about part two of loving the lost, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, I really had some good intents for part two to actually give a little bit deeper in the revelation, but what the Lord was showing me was I need to basically just give a biblical example, and that's what we're going to go through tonight. So it started out really simple. You know, you start looking at the Scripture say, this looks like a fairly simple biblical example. But the minute you get into the Word, all of a sudden, there's, there's new purposes and new destinies inside of what you thought was a fairly simple interaction. So I'm thinking, well, maybe that's what you're trying to tell us. We don't know the meaning of all these interactions we have. We look at it and we get excited for something that happened, but we don't know the fullness of what's going to happen. We know that we've planted some seeds, but we don't know how, how they're going to grow up or what's going to happen. Because God is at a special time for us. Now, uh, if you haven't seen the, the part one of this, you really need to watch that because that's really sort of the foundation of all of this. And it's out there on YouTube on Impact Ministry Center. So part two, I planned on just doing an illustration. But I noticed that we do have a lot of new people who probably haven't seen the part one. So I said, Lord, how am I going to cover the discussion about this? So he, he gave me a way just to go with the prophecy. And I'm going to cover that in a second. But one thing I did not talk about last week is why do I call this loving the lost? I mean, where did that come from? Well, where it came from is the Lord said, I want you to do a message on loving the lost. <laughs> so I said, excuse me, Lord. Now, I don't know how you all talk to God or how that works for you. But, if, you know, if I was one of the disciples, I would be there saying, excuse me, Lord. Do you want me to uh, ask my questions now or hold them till the end? <laughs> You know, that's, I, I'm more of a dialogue kind of person. So he says, I want you to talk on loving the lost. I said, right. What's, what does that mean? You know, because God, to be honest with you, I'm not sure I'm that person. Because to be honest with you, I don't love everybody. I mean, there's people out there just evil. You know? I mean, there's people who basically uh, would be proud to be elected as the Antichrist. I mean, it's, it's like in their heart. They're just evil. They're serving the devil. They're worshiping the devil. I said, you know, I don't love them. I don't love the devil. I don't think he's going to repent next week. I don't love demons. They're not going to repent either. So, Lord, I'm trying to understand. Um, I'm not sure I'm the right guy to talk about loving the lost. And he says, oh, yeah, yes, you are. You need, to, you need the message. So I said, okay, well, let's take another look at this. What does it mean, loving the lost? And I made an assumption by looking at it. It means I'm supposed to love everybody. But when you start talking to God, you find out, well, that may not be exactly the right interpretation. For instance, what does it mean to be loving, and what does it mean about being lost? Well, I said, okay, loving people, that's loving everybody, isn't it? He says, no, loving's a verb. It's an act. 
He says, I said, well, God, I don't love everybody. He says, I'm not asking you to love everybody, but I am asking you not to judge them because how are you going to love people you don't know? Yes, you can have compassion, but you can't love people you don't know. So I'm not asking you to love them, but I am asking you not to judge them because you don't know them. You don't know their callings and purposes, but I do. So the judgment is my job. So what I want you to do is to share me with them. Share my love. And you just love my truth. And then you go and share what I tell you to share with who I send you to. That means loving the truth is literally giving God's truth and love to the person that he sends you to. You may not love that person, but I'm finding out I don't have to love that person. But what I do need to love is the truth. I need to love, the, know what I'm giving those people. And so that's what he was showing me. So I said, okay, Lord, uh, what do you mean by the lost? You're talking about the unsaved, right? Because isn't that what we usually think of when we think of religious interpretation of the lost? And he says, nope, that's what I'm talk not what I'm talking about. So I went up and looked up the word lost. And you know what it means? It means people who don't understand where they are or don't understand where they're trying to go. And I'm thinking, see, I was assuming that the lost people are the people who are unsaved and the others are not. They're saved. But no, God's saying that I, he has a lot of people out there who don't know the truth and they're lost. And these are saved people. So I said, well, what's the key here, Lord? What's this about? And he said, what I'm asking you to do is love my truth. To gather as much truth as you can, then I can use you and I can send you wherever I want. Because you don't even have to love that person. If you love the truth, you will love sharing that truth because it's in your heart. And you'll express it and you'll do it with my love. And so that's what he's been showing me how to express the truth, the things he gives you to express with his love, not our own. Because we can't love everybody. Because we don't know everybody, but he does. So as I looked at this, I said, okay, let's look at these people here. And last week was right before, of course, they did the Roe v. Wade decision. So we were talking about this group of people. And we looked at their signs and we said, Wow, this is interesting. Keep your rosaries off my ovaries. Um, you're pro-life until your baby is poor, black, trans, Latinx, etc., gay, you know. And then another one says, I love someone who had an abortion. And I'm saying, what are these people saying? And what they're saying is that they think they're being judged and they're trying to justify their situation. And I look at it and say, does the church really know how to handle these things? Do we love these people? What do they really need? And what the Lord told me is what they really need is truth. Because people are lost when they don't know the truth. How can they make a judgment? How can they make a call if they haven't heard the truth? Now, you all are lovers of the truth or you wouldn't be here. Because you don't get paid to come here. Uh, none of us get paid here, so we're here because we love God and we love His truth. So, to preparation for all of this is to listen to God, spend time with Him, and know His heart and His truth. And then we can go and share it. And we talked a little bit about that before, because when we look at the situation and we look at all these people protesting, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it sort of depends, doesn't it? It depends on what God's purpose is right now. What is it that God is trying to accomplish? We talked about last week about what happened where James and John going into a city in Samaria that didn't like them, and they said, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven on these guys? He says, no, that, you don't understand. And then there was Peter who said, no, Lord, you got to stop talking about this get crucified stuff because that's a lousy plan, and we got to stop this. But it wasn't a lousy plan, was it? You see, God has plans and purposes for things. And I believe he's got a plan and a purpose for what's going on right now. I think it's presenting an incredible opportunity for us. 
Because these people are going to find out really soon that they've been lied to. They'll find out more and more that the things they've been told are going to bring them satisfaction or anything else in this world. They're going to find out it's based on a lie. So what are they going to come looking for? They're going to look for the truth. And that's when you find Jesus. So we need to know the truth. We need to understand his word, but we need to know what's really going on out there. Because a lot of Christians even are dying right now because they don't know the truth. They don't know what's going on out there. They, would, they don't conceive of the fact that we have a media and, and we have a medical system and we have an education system and we have an entertainment system and all of these things could have that much corruption and be evil and be telling us lies. So who knows the truth? Those who have the spirit. And we talked about that. Second Thessalonians 2 last week that he said, yes, a deception was given because they did not love the truth. So that's my heart right now, is that each of us need to know the truth. Because God is looking for people to make a choice. He didn't have to have the devil down here, did he? He could have just taken everybody to heaven. Forget the devil being down on earth. Why, does, why is he here anyway? He's here so that we have an opportunity to make a choice. Because God wants to be loved, and love requires a choice. He's not looking for obedience. He's looking for love. And for love, you have to have a choice. And that's what I think the world is looking for. And therefore, we must be able to give them the truth so that they can make the right choice. If they make the wrong choice, that's on them. But if they don't know the truth, I'm getting more and more convinced that's sort of on us because that's what we should be sharing with these people. We can't make their decisions for them, but we can tell them the truth. And I'm sort of getting tired of seeing people suffering and dying around me that I even know when I had a truth that could have helped them. When I know they're looking for something, but they're looking in the wrong place. So with this, let's just go into the, the message a little bit. And I, as you see from the pictures, I'm talking about certain groups of people here, but actually it could be anyone. We talked about the, uh, the gay life parade here. And these people are saying, hey, this is righteous and this is holy and this is a good thing. And the abortion people, we're looking at them and they're saying, why are you judging me? Because this is a good thing. But what makes it good is it's the, tr the truth of God. God has the best plan for everybody, every single person. If you don't believe that, you're going to have trouble out there sharing truth with them. It's not just about getting them saved. It's about you've got to get them in looking for the truth, and that will lead them to the salvation of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the truth. And the sooner they know that, the sooner that their life is going to get better and better. So I'm just going to look. This word last week came from a word from actually two years ago. And I'll just read that, and that will be my summary from last week. He said, do you love the truth? For love is an issue of the heart. Love motivates you to care and to cherish, to uphold and to defend. Love will believe and care the same in both public and private. What you love is what you treasure. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. To know me, you must know my truth. To love me, you must love my truth. If you cannot love my truth, you cannot love me. For I am love and my word is truth. Seek my truth and repent. For I offer it freely and you must worship me in spirit and in truth. I'm calling forth pastors, prophets, and priests in these days that love the truth and will speak my truth out of love. For out of the abundance of your heart must come the words of truth. Only a pure heart can speak my truth, for my word is truth. I will judge the words of the pastors, prophets, and priests who speak with arrogance, self-righteousness, and retribution, or agree with the lies, for if they cannot carry my heart, they cannot carry my truth. The power of deception lies in pride, the lust, the shame of the heart, but truth can set them free. See, they don't know that. 
A lot of these people that, that had abortions, they're dealing with shame. They invited the spirit of death into their body and they're struggling. And they don't know they can be free from those things. They think the best thing to do is just justify them. And then they don't feel bad. But you understand, they can be set free by the blood of Jesus. Be not proud, for you were once in bondage to the lies of this world, but you most, must humbly and boldly speak my truth from a heart of love to win your brother's love to me and my truth. For love of my truth is a true witness of your love for me. And I think that's really the key that he wants me to share here. So we're going to look at an example in the Bible. And though I started out just wanting to do it as an illustration, it turned into a Bible study. So we're going to get a little bit of Bible study. And let me start out with just Ephesians 5.17, my favorite scripture. Do not be foolish, but understand <clears throat> excuse me, what the Lord's will is. That God is saying we need to understand what it is that's His will. And once we do, we're not worried about sin, be honest with you, because if we know the truth, sin is just stupid. And therefore, I believe if we give people the truth, it's up to them to make a choice. And so many more are going to make that choice for Jesus when they know that He is the truth. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to start with John the John the Baptist discussion in John 3, 34 through 36, the last three verses of John 3. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. There it is. God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get some water here. So if we look at this, Jesus came down here, and he's obviously talking about Jesus. But when Jesus came down here, didn't he come to teach us? Wasn't that what this is all about? Didn't they call him teacher? So when you see something that Jesus is supposed to do, and this is what we've talked about in the series Healing the Sick, that when we read the Bible, we need to go back and read it, not as this is what Jesus did, but this is instructions on what we should be doing. So when you see this, the one whom God sent speaks the words of God. That's the truth. So if he's sending you, he's sending you to speak his words. And he does it by the Spirit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. He's placed a whole lot of things in our hands. I hate to say it, but we haven't done a great job lately because the situation we're in happened on our watch. We allowed the lies to come forth because we did not stand up for the truth. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. Now, does it say whoever, um, whoever is gay or LGBT or if you've had an abortion? No, he says it's whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. I'm not sure we're holding the right discussions. We're out there judging people and putting labels on them. And through those labels, we're judging people we don't know. And I think God is saying, it's, I'm not asking you to judge those people. I'm asking you to get to know them and by the Spirit share the truth because that's what they need. They can make their own decisions. You just need to share truth with them. Because the real key is whether or not they accept Jesus Christ. That's what it says. It doesn't say that we're here for behavioral modifications. It says we're here to share the truth. And it also says that whoever rejects the Son, God's wrath remains on him. In other words, we're all born in sin. And it's not, he didn't come to judge us. Why? Because we're already judged. And we just need to be able to share that with people. So as we go for this, the reason I wanted to read this is this is the verse right before we're going to start in John 4. And let me just look at this in a brief Bible study. John 4, 1 through 6. 
And the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who was baptizing, but his disciples. Now see, right there it is. He's training the disciples to do the work, right? Because that's the plan. When the Lord learned of this, he left for Judea and went back to Galilee. So he's saying, well, maybe I need to protect the disciples. I don't think we're ready yet for this. And I'm not sure we're ready now. But he says, now we have to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tried, or tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. So if we look at this situation, what are we talking about when we're talking about Samaria? Well, first of all, you understand that Judea and Jerusalem was where the temple was, but Galilee was where he lived. So basically, between his house and church, he needed to make stop. See, we think that all things are supposed to take place either at home or at the church, right? But what's happening here? There's this group of people between here and home that are the Samaritans. And that's our Samaria. And you look at it and you say, wait a minute, what's significant here in this place? Well, you remember he said that Jacob had this land and he gave it to Joseph. So I said, well, let's take a look at where that was. And sure enough, we see that Jacob had left Israel and then came back to Israel. But when he came back, he wrestled the angel in Peniel. He, he met with um, Esau there in that blue dot. And then he went to Shechem, which is the same place as Sychar. So that's where this well was. It just happens to be where Jacob came in and dug this well. So maybe there's something significant for this location. When I'm looking at this up, why would you include this in the Bible, Lord? And so I'm looking at something simple, but what I'm realizing is something greater is taking place here than I even realize. So I looked at the scripture, and sure enough, Jacob built an altar there. When he came into the land, he built an altar. He says that's the place he came to after leaving uh, Laban. He arrived safely at Shechem in Canaan, camped there. And, for, and then for a hundred pieces of silver, he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, a plot of ground where he pitched his tent, and there he set up an altar. It's called El Elohim, which is mighty is the God of Israel. So that spot is significant because Jacob built an altar there. He had a reason. As a matter of fact, he gave the land to Jacob and uh, Joseph, and Joseph, who, as you remember, was down in Egypt, when he died... They brought his bones back and buried them in Shechem. So there's something really special about this place where Jesus stopped. If we look in, it just so happens that why it was so special was it turns out that Abraham had also been to Shechem. As a matter of fact, that's where he entered the land of Canaan. And we can look at the map there and say, sure enough, that's why it was special. Abram passed through the land as far as, as the site of Shechem, the Oak of Morah. Now the Canaanites were in the land at that time, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. So now do you see why that land was important? It was the place where that land was dedicated unto Abraham and the people, his descendants. So there's something significant happening here. See, when we're just witnessing and we're going and sharing something, God is telling us to go a certain place and give a certain word, we don't always know this is the significance of that. So this just happens to be the place where Abram was given the land. And now Jacob is there, and now Joseph is going to be buried there. As a matter of fact, when Joshua came into town, guess where he went? Shechem. That's right. Right there, Shechem, Mount Ebal, and Mount Gerizim. Why? Well, it turns out that God had told Moses, I'm setting before you today blessings and cursings. When the Lord your God has brought you to the land you are entering to possess, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings 
and Mount Ebal the curses. Now, we know Moses didn't make it in, but Joshua did. And what did Joshua do? He built on Mount Ebal an altar to the Lord. Half of the people stood on Mount Gerizim, the other half on Mount Ebal. And Joseph, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and the cursings. So that spot is where the land was dedicated. And it was dedicated here by Joshua to the law because he read the law and confirmed the covenant on that very spot, the first place he did that. So all of these people, Abraham, Jacob, Joshua, all of them built altars on this one spot. So there's something very significant about this spot. As a matter of fact, I went ahead and just took a look at them and see how close these little places are. They're within four miles of each other. Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim, Jacob's Well, Shechem, Moreh. So there's something special about this place. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm just going through trying to understand. It looked something very simple that I thought that you were just going to witness to this one girl by this well. And what I'm finding out that there's something very significant in what happened here. And we don't know the significance of some of the things that we're doing. We just think that, oh, well, this is not a big deal, and I'm just going to say this or something. Or there's a, is there a reason why this is happening? But remember what we talked about. We talked that we need to understand God's truth and his prophecies because his prophecies are prophetic patterns and they repeat. And if you want a prophetic result, enter a prophetic situation. Recognize it and you'll know something. When you're in a prophetic situation, you're going to get prophetic results. And that can be very powerful. So for some reason, now we thought that this was just a casual stop because as you see, these people that were there uh, in the land, the Samaria, were basically all these people we're talking about every day. These are these, these, these women who are protesting abortions. These are the LGBTQ. Because if you remember, the Jews didn't like them, and they didn't like the Jews. So that's the people we're talking about, and yet Jesus chose to be right there at that moment. So I believe there's something significant. So we're going to look at this. When a Samaritan woman came to draw the water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, why would he have done that? Do you see that he's establishing a rapport? And we've got to learn how to go out there in the world and simply establish a rapport. And it was that simple. Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Now, can you see that happening with someone that's LGBTQ or Someone that's just came off an you know, a, a abortion parade. But the Lord is saying, no, this is what I expect of you. So Jesus answered, says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So he establishes a rapport and now says, you know what? There's, you're coming back to this well all the time to get a drink, but I've got something that will satisfy you. You're not going to have to come here every day to be satisfied because something that's, I've got something else. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? You see, this well, if we look at this well, it's a big old thing and it took, a, it took buckets and so on to get down in it. It's basically religion. Isn't that what religion was? Remember, it's Jacob's well. It was donated or dedicated to the law so what we're talking about is this well that he's trying to dip from is hard to get to. You've got to keep coming back and forth to get to it religiously, naturally. And it takes special tools to get it out, right? Special this, special that, special this. You have nothing to draw with. We haven't, we haven't got any liturgy for that. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Wow. Wow. Now, there's a revelation that she had. She was obviously prompted to say something here. You see, right there is the point. Is he greater than Jacob? Is this a comparison between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? Are you bringing something better? Better than what I thought God was all about? Better than what I thought I had? Have you got something better? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank it for himself? 
And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Isn't that true with the religion that's out there a lot, a lot, a lot with people? And they're looking at it and say, wait a minute, you guys look pretty thirsty too. No, we are supposed to have the living water inside of us. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You understand, this is the first thing he came to after going up to Jerusalem and being baptized by John the Baptist and going out and doing some ministry there. He's coming back home. They don't know who he is up there. And right now, he's offering these people living water. This one woman. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back to draw water. Can you see that this well was not satisfying. Can you see that this is where these people are? Can you see these people out there uh, trying to burn down the government building every other night? And after about 60 tries, they're thinking, you know what, we've been doing this for like 60 nights out here, and um, I can't say that I'm any happier. We can ask them that. Are you guys you know, now enjoying this, or why are you doing this? Well, you know we have to. I'm telling you, those people out there are like this. They're looking for something. They're needing something. And we know what it is. And are we telling them? Are we sharing it with them? The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back to draw water. So here's a... You understand, he is the well. There's two wells here. Jacob's well of religion and Jesus' well of relationship with him personally. So now we're revealing the new temple. He's actually revealing to this Samaritan woman at the well the truth about, I'm coming to turn you into the temple of God and give you the Holy Spirit. Continuing on, he's, in John 7, he actually comes out back in Jerusalem and tells them this later on. The last great day of the feast, Jesus stood with a loud voice and said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. He meant the Spirit, which was later to be received. But yet he offered it to the Samaritan woman earlier. You see, I look at this and say, Lord, you're establishing something in that location with a person. You've sown a seed, and you don't know what seeds you've sown and the significance of those things. But it's amazing to me that this is important to him. This is a Samaritan woman, just like all these people out there that you see protesting right now. The law and the new covenant. John testified concerning him. And when John was testifying about Jesus, he said, Out of the fullness we have all received grace in places of grace already given. Well, there it is right there. What was the grace already given? The law. He said, he has come to give us a new grace in place of the grace we already have. In the very place that it was dedicated, the nation was dedicated to the law, he has now come to that very place and offering a new grace. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's the comparison right there. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is the closest relationship with Father has made him known. Now, you understand this is our goal right here. Who is himself God. In other words, we're not God, but we're representing Jesus Christ. We're his body. And is in close relationship with the Father. You see, that's who we're supposed to be. We're supposed to represent who God is and making him known. And that's what Jesus was there to do, and that's what he still wants to do. He wants to do it through us. And obviously Isaiah mentioned this in Isaiah 55. Come all who are thirsty, come to the waters. Why spend money on what is not bread? Your labor on what is not satisfied. She's not satisfied. Listen to me, eat what is good, and your soul delights. So he came to fulfill a prophecy. And he fulfilled it with a woman that had all these problems. 
And I'm realizing now, Lord, there's so many opportunities you're giving us. And I'm looking at this situation saying, Lord, we don't want to miss a moment. Because we don't understand the investment in the kingdom of what this could be. We do know one thing, that we are in kingdom school right now, right? Because this is kingdom school. And right now, we're in a place to decide what our place is in the kingdom. And I believe that's exactly what we've got right now. So we need to pay attention. And we need to do everything we can to understand that the truth that we're given is not just for us. He's preparing us to be able to give that truth. And so he's giving you things. And that's why you must love the truth. You must seek out after it because he wants to, you to be able to go out and feed his flock. Feed those people who need the truth. That's why we seek all of this stuff. That's why we've got to be able to share this stuff. People are perishing right now because we have not shared the truth that we know. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their thoughts and the unright their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy and he'll give free pardon. Those people who had the abortions, who have the spirit of death in their body and are, are struggling right now with guilt or shame, they can be free. And we can set them free. They don't have to justify what they did. They just need to be free. They need to know the truth. And they can be free of the guilt and shame if they'll come to Jesus Christ and be washed in the blood. That's what they need. So then Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come back. Now, why would he have done that? Isn't that strange? Could it be that, well, you know, it's not good to minister to a woman, right? A man and a woman at the well. But I think he made a point here because she said, I have no husband. But Jesus said to her, you know, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands and the man you are now have is not your husband. Five husbands? You know, what is that all about? Could it be that back then... They weren't doing abortions? Could it be that back then, when you got pregnant, you automatically got married? And then they, of course, divorced. So could this be one of those people? Maybe that's why they want abortion, so they don't have to go through five marriages. Just because they got pregnant. You see, what the situation is, was he condemning her? What was he doing? He was revealing the, the truth that she is drinking out of the wrong well. She's looking for love, but she's not finding it. And he's revealed the need that's in her. That's what he's doing. He's not judging her for the sin. He's saying, look, I can see right now you've had five husbands, and the one you got isn't your husband now. You're looking for love. You're drinking out of the wrong well. But there's a well that will satisfy you. And when we look at these people, they're angry, they're upset, they're this, they're that. Something's causing all of that. There's a root to this. And the Lord will reveal it using the spiritual gifts that he's given you. And I believe he's given us anointings to get in there and deal with that issue. And that issue is opening the door for them to know the truth. So I don't know that I'm supposed to stand up on some stump and preach the gospel. I think very often he's going to send me to different people. And those people he may have been working on for three years. We don't know. But at that very moment, he's arranged a meeting. And we're supposed to go there and be prepared with the truth and know how to reach the truth and know how to use our spiritual gifts so that we can either sow a seed or reap a harvest. And that's what he's doing right here. He's using a very simple word of knowledge to reveal what her problem is. Sir, woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. There it is, right? Hey, hey we got our building over here. You know, we're, we're Catholics over there, and you're saying we should be over here in, in First Church, Baptist Church. But he's looking at these two and he's saying, wait a minute, which one should we be worshiping in? What's his answer? Believe me, woman, 
The time is coming when you will worship the Father neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. There is someone that's lost. See, you're worshiping in a building, but you don't know who you're worshiping. And I think that's a lot of the problem right now. We don't know. They don't know the Lord. They think He's in a building over there. And He says, no, a time is coming when you'll worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And actually, during COVID, that's literally what happened, right? Didn't the church leave the building? You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know, we know at least know about, for salvations from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You don't need a building to hold the Holy Spirit anymore. He's saying, no, I am going to give you the Holy Spirit so you won't need to go to a building to find me. You can find me right here. What do people think? He says, back then they didn't know any better. Do we know better now? I mean, I'm, I'm really, this is amazing to me. We, um, you know, we, we were talking about testimonies on Sunday. Uh, Laura and I went up, uh, went up to the mountains and we decided to, you know, sit and have a burger someplace. And these uh, four people came up and sat beside us and it was sort of like a long bar stool kind of place. And so I started talking to the guy. And the guy had physical problems. He was a COPD and he had diabetes and so on. I got to talking to him. He was a he was a 101st Airborne military guy, and um, an older guy. And I'm talking to him, and all of a sudden, it's, it became clear that what he needed was prayer, and he needed Jesus. Well, it turns out that the two people with him have been, he says, yeah, I, I got to talking to him about Jesus, and he's talking to me. And he says, yeah, my neighbors here have been trying to get me to go to church for six months. <laughs> and they're sitting over their side. So, of course, Laura and I just got up and prayed for him. And they looked at us like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. This is, there's a, encounters that he's going to have. It's not about taking you to my church. Exactly. It's not, he's not going to have to worship in this building or this building. That's the wrong well. Yes. You've got to know the living God. And just by going out and showing them that, Things change. So now the guys over there talking to them about Jesus. Just because he felt something that oh, we cared enough to pray for the guy. Amen. Time is coming when the worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. They are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. And see, we don't have to go through the whole thing. We don't have to drag them through church and, and go all the religious ways. We just got to introduce them to Jesus and disciple them into the truth. We need to sow seeds and let them grow. We need to pray for them that the Holy Spirit will come in and disciple them. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything. We'll get truth then. And Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Do you realize what he just said? To this Samaritan woman, if he would have been in Jerusalem and said that, they would have hung him immediately, right? Crucified him that day. But he's sitting there and saying, I am he. He declared it right there on that one spot, the same spot where they read the law. He now is bringing forth a new covenant and a new law, and he's sowing it right there in this one Samaritan woman. It wasn't even a Jew. So what did she do? Well... She said, come see a man who told me everything I could have done. He ran to town. But notice it says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town. Does that mean she left her rosary beads and she left all the... Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. She left all that stuff that she needed, all the liturgies and all the other things, saying, I don't need this anymore. I got a direct line. And dropped it. She left her water jar and went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. All he said was, you've had five husbands. So what did, the, so what did he tell her? Every, the reason I did everything that I ever did. He showed me who I am. 
That's more important than what I did. It's who I am and what I need. Come see a man who told me everything that I, that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And then they started come out of the town. Disciples came and said, hey, you know what, something to eat? And he said, no, my food is to do the will of one who sent me. But don't say there's four months more and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. And that, can you see that's what's happening right now out there? All these people protesting, all these people this and all that. There's a truth that will set them free. They're looking for something just like the woman at the well was looking. It's not about their sin. It's about their relationship with Jesus. Because they're doing it because they're trying to meet some need. And Jesus has the way to meet that need. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay, and he stayed two more days. And because of his words, many of them, many more of them became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. Isn't that the ultimate thing? They no longer believe because of what you told them. They believe because they heard it themselves. And I think that's exciting to me. That they've got a connection with the Lord themselves and they can hear themselves. That's exciting. So do we have to love everybody? I'm not convinced we do. We don't know everybody. But if we love the Lord and we love his truth, we can share that. And he just basically said in Matthew 10, do not fear them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. And do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. He said that we shouldn't be f afraid to share the truth. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And as we shared last week, that doesn't mean obey there. It means to keep, to protect, to care for, to preserve. If you love me, you'll protect my truth out there. And we haven't done a great job of that. But he says, I'll send you the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he does not see him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So that's the truth. You must love the truth and you must be ready because he's going to send you if you're ready. So I'm just encouraging everybody to seek after God. Seek after what he's got to say, even if you don't need it. And activate your spiritual gifts because you're going to need them. One simple gift of saying a word of knowledge can open a door. It's amazing what you're seeing here. Just praying for someone who's sick just by asking a question. How are you doing? It's amazing what can happen when you do that ministry. We don't want to miss this opportunity. And I think that's the key. So this was really more of a Bible study than it was probably a, uh, a message. But hopefully as you read the Bible, I want you to read it as what we should be doing. Because that's what this Bible is all about. Go through the red letters now and don't treat it like this is what Jesus did. Treat it like this is what I should be doing. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the truth and that you're sharing your truth through us and each one here, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that you open that door of revelation and you touch each one here. We thank you for your truth, Lord, and the love that you've given us for that. We seek to know it and we need to know you, Lord, so that the world may know who you are. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That was a great message, James. I was, um, Trish and I were just talking. It's, it's sort of like a Selah moment, you know? It's because the real challenge is we've had a miracle, right? Roe v. is overturned, but the problem is those people think they're mad at us. 
<laughs> because they're like, the Christians did this, you know? And the truth is, no, Jesus did this because they don't know that they were created in the image of God in the womb. He created them and he created every life thereafter. And that's the truth that they don't know, but they're not going to know that truth until they meet Jesus because Jesus establishes that truth. I was born in um, 70 right before this became um, legal. And, um, and my mom was a mother of five <laughs> and she could have been married because she had six husbands <laughs> and we all had different dads. And by the grace of God, we're all here on this planet. And unfortunately, we don't all know each other. But the truth is, she didn't know the value of a life. But she found out at 70 what that was. And his name was Jesus. And then she was able to go back and try to restore those broken places. And that's our challenge. Because if we label these things, we'll never get to tell them truth. But the truth is, they have an enemy. His name is Satan. We're not the enemy, but we're the bringer of truth. We're the bringers of life. And so I think um, with that, this is kind of like Trish said, it's, it's, it's a heavy message because we have to rethink how we're going to do this thing. You know, we're, it's, it's not going to work the way we used to do it. We're in a new season. The church is going to be a new wineskin. So we want to do this God's way. And I believe that... Um, story illustrates so much the compassion, the heart, and the truth of Jesus. He didn't skirt the issues. He was bold, but he did it with an anointing, did it with love, he did it with truth, and he brought out the real problems. And I think that's where we're headed because now we have a job to do. Now we get to tell them, I know you're angry, but let's talk about why. Why are you angry? And when you start to get to the roots of things, you find out truly really not the problem at all. <laughs> you really find out what they're angry about and where the wounding comes. So we're um, going to transition. I know that CJ had a word, if he's ready. He says he has a word. And um, we'll transition to some. Um, we kind of are running a little bit late, so we'll only stay. We have a couple words for people, but we'll be cognizant of the time. If you guys don't mind, like five more minutes or so. I have to apologize ahead of time because this is not going to be like anything I've done before here or recently at a buying or anything. This is, I'm sitting back there and I just feel like I have something from God. And I, I most of the time, you know, when I prophesy or give something, I give a lot of latitude. I don't feel that right now. And if I feel anything, I just want to say it directly because I feel like, I want to honor God. It has to be said. What he's saying in my heart, I will say it like he's saying it, okay? Because he wants to speak something. Is that okay? Do I have pretty much? All right. God is saying, God says, great is my faithfulness to you. Not good. Great is my faithfulness to you. My faithfulness is not right or wrong. It doesn't have to be good. It can be hardship. But it's my faithfulness that takes you through something to the other side. For I am great, says the Lord. I will show myself great in this hour, says the Lord. For George Washington crossed the Potomac. I was there, says the Lord. Before there was a constitution or an independence written, I protected. I was there, says the Lord. When Abraham Lincoln stated what he stated, I was with him. I was there, says the Lord. But there was a divided nation then. There was a divided nation when George Washington fought. There was a divided nation of slavery versus freedom. There has always been a war. There will always be a war. But does that change anything, says the Lord, for great is my faithfulness. 
For I stood with those who fought for what was right. For great was my faithfulness then. And then when there was another man that stood and preached for civil rights, great was my faithfulness then. I changed this land many times. I, I came involved in the issues of that day for many reasons because I have a plan, says the Lord. And I use very few people in their faithfulness. I was even greater, says the Lord. Because I protected them not because it was America. I protected them not because there was a constitution. I protected them not because they declared their independence. That came as fruit of my work. For great is my faithfulness. Don't put me on a place where I have to do everything where you want it to be done, says the Lord. For I will do what is best, says the Lord. But I'm about to do things you've never seen. There will be people that will give their lives for me, says the Lord, just as George Washington fought and people died for me. Just as people fought the Civil War and people died for me. Although there is a divided nation before you, says the Lord, there has always been a nation undivided. One nation of my doing, a people of mine, says the Lord. And this people will rise again. And even now you have a choice, says the Lord. You choose today who you will serve. You choose today to understand it is time to rise up and fight for freedom, fight for the lost, fight for those who are orphans and widows, says the Lord. Fight for those who are now going to be struggling because of gas prices. Fight for those who can hardly pay the rent. Fight for those who are hurting because I am knocking on their door, says the Lord. Fight for them because they see you. Fight for them because they see you. They're waiting. They're hoping there's something good. But they don't know that it's not the good they need. It's the great. The great is my faithfulness, says the Lord. Can you hear me, says the Lord? Then say great is his faithfulness. Say it now. I love and I'm, I'm stepping out of prophetic right now. I, I love being raised by Episcopal parents, if not for the responsive readings. I love, you know, when they did that, the reading, and everybody would say back, you know, for your loving kindness endures forever. Can we say that? Your loving kindness endures forever. I am so, oh, just like, I'm, I'm so, things are changing. Can you feel it? I go to church over at Abiding. I mean, every week, I'm, I'm kind of a little concerned because I get things so often, and, and it bothers me. It actually bothers me. I don't like, people think I like getting up. I do it like, like getting up when I feel like I know what's going to happen next. But when God's happening, it's like you're losing a bit of control, aren't you? And so me getting up and giving a word, and I feel like, oh, gosh, are they going to, you know. It's the same thing when we're reaching out to people. But it can be really fun. Um, today, our electrician gave his life to Jesus. And, you know, I've written a book, so he was all excited. I hear a book. I said, you know, I, I don't think, you know, I need to just give you a book. I think you need the real stuff because... You know, God wants to show you through the Holy Spirit. And he said, well, you know, I've been raised and, and I, my mom's been praying for us. I said, you know, well, this is your time. And he left like, uh, I said, here's my number. Sign the book. I said, just call me. You have any questions? Call me. I felt like for once I started to understand why I've gone down the path I'm on. And I think we need to understand why you've gone and you've gone on the path you've gone on. Because God has no accidents. If necessary, you be distressed by various trials. I'm now, I greatly rejoice, is what Peter says. That you'd be distressed by various trials. Like, God has a plan. Like, it, who can say something and it happen unless God permits it, right? Because out of his mouth come both good and ill. Like, God is not, 
not, you cannot control God. God can do, you know, things we like and things we don't. Let's just put it that way, right? And we can go through some tough times. And yet, when we discover God has a plan, because we're coming out of it, we're coming towards something. It's the plan to get somewhere. And so when we understand that passage says, if necessary, be, bit, try, uh, be distressed so that the proof of your faith proven as gold will produce something awesome and you will be impenetrable in your faith. Because faith isn't good, it's... Aha! Uh -huh. Because great is his faithfulness. Amen. OJ, that was an, I mean, OJ, I can't believe I caught, that was an OJ word right there. CJ, that was, you haven't met OJ, I don't think, but CJ, that was an OJ word. That was a powerful word. Um, you felt the presence of God on that. It's so good. Um, so we're going to transition really quick. I know Trish had a word, and we'll see. Did you have a, we, we have like, we'll do, we, okay. So um, I just don't want to keep everybody. I mean, I know you're here, and we'll we'll talk. We're we're prophetic people. We'll encourage and prophesy. So I'm gonna pray this out. Father God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for what you're doing, Lord. I do like like CJ says. I feel the excitement. Something has changed. You're getting us prepared for this next season. We are crossing the Jordan. Lord, and I love that one thing he said. He says, I, I have a united, and I, I could finish this like, yes, he has a bride that he's prepared that's united for the things of the kingdom. Though the world is divided, your bride is united. And we are going to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, Father. I thank you that we get to share in this. We get to be part of this. And Lord, I thank you. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.